I'd like to turn to John, Gospel of John, chapter 1. I'd like to begin to read in verse 1. Hallelujah. And the Word says, In the beginning was the Word, capital W, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then skip down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Hallelujah. I just want to preach a little while on the master's plan the master's plan amen if you lay your bible down we could come before god one more time before we, the preaching begins and let's ask god to touch our hearts tonight lord god we need you in this place thank you for the music thank you for the worship thank you for the first word thank you for the prayer before service god continue to move in this place lord god we feel your presence lord god and we appreciate it and we love to feel your presence. And we invite you further, God, Lord God, to do your will in this service tonight. And we love you and we praise you. And let's give him a hand clap right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus, we love you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. The master's plan. Now, the uh, Gospel of John, if you're familiar with the Bible, is very unique in, throughout the entire book, but especially in its introduction. Um, in the Gospel of John, unlike Matthew, Mark, or Luke, John didn't start with Jesus' uh, lineage and, what, and where he was from and the bloodline, but rather John goes to the very beginning of time as we know it. In the beginning refers to our universe as we know it today when the clock started to tick. Before that beginning, there was, there was only eternity. There was no time. Because God exists outside of time, um, he can see the end from the beginning. Time to God is like a panoramic view. He can stand outside of it and look at it. And he knows when it started because he was there and he started it. And he can see the ending. And he, can pre and he knows everything that's going to happen in between. Unlike us where we cannot see into the future. But before the time there was nothing. There was nothing even to comprehend. There was nothing to experience. There was nothing to even observe. But the Bible says that God had a plan when he started the beginning. And because of the master's plan, we have an eternal purpose. Isn't it great to have a purpose in life? And what's the point of life if you don't have a purpose? Without a purpose, we would just be toiling around on earth trying to make a dollar or two. But thank God we have a purpose. And I want to talk about God's master, uh, his master plan for us. Now... This passage that we just read is a wonderful passage uh, because it starts at the very beginning of time and what happened. Now, it shows a few things. It shows what happened and it also, by definition, shows what didn't happen. What is not showing is a trinity. Some will tell you that the trinity is a mystery and that you cannot fully comprehend it. Some will refer to 1 Timothy 3.16. It says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Now, I would fully agree with that verse, obviously, and I will fully agree that you cannot fully comprehend the Trinity because you cannot fully comprehend something that's not sound. The Trinity is not only unsound, but it's patently false doctrine. It is perhaps one of, if not the most damaging doctrines that's ever plagued Christian theology. 1 Timothy 3.16 is not talking about a Trinity, but it's talking about an almighty God 
who made the universe and made himself into a man so he could save us from our sins. That's the only thing it's talking about. The only reason the Trinity is a mystery is because nobody can understand it. John 1 and 1 is also nicely complimented by Revelations 13, 8. And it says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, we know that Jesus was not slain in the beginning of the world. It doesn't say that in John 1, 1. We know Jesus rather was executed on the cross while he was on earth. So what does that mean? What does the passage mean? Well, what it is telling us is that God had a plan from the beginning. He had a plan that one day that he would come down and robe himself in flesh and die on the cross from us. He had that plan in the beginning of time that one day that man would fall, that man would need a Savior, and he would come down and die for us because of his love is so great. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the earth in the mind of God. God predicated all of his creation on the fact that we would need a Savior one day. He didn't just create earth and mankind and just rolled the dice and hopefully it worked out for the best. But God, because of his all-knowing ability and power, he had a plan in place already. Let me tell you tonight that when you walked in these doors, God had a plan in place for you. To take it even further, before you were even born, God had a plan for you on earth. Amen. God, from the beginning, had a plan in his mind when he created everything. And that goes down to the very last blade of grass that sprouts out of the ground. Uh, hallelujah. God knows you. He knows every sparrow. He knows every number of hair on your head. Uh, hallelujah. And he has a plan for you tonight. Amen. On June 11, 1962, one such master plan was followed through with what is known as today is the infamous escape from Alcatraz. There had been many attempts to break out of the once called escape-proof Alcatraz, but all were met with failure. That is until Frank Morris met up with John and Clarence Anglin, the brothers, and also Alan West. The plan to escape Alcatraz was put into uh, motion after months and months of meticulous planning by the very intelligent Frank Morris. It was time for them to implement their plan, and they started to work at it slowly and methodically. They followed the plan to a T and escaped except for one. But the question is, did they really escape? Well, they escaped out of the walls, but did they survive their escape? Most likely, they don't believe that they survived due to the frigid, shark-infested waters, the jagged rocks, and the strong current. But here's the problem with their, their escape, uh, escape attempt. Is that the problem was that they implemented the wrong plan. Now, to them, they thought they had the right plan when they got out of the walls and they thought they were home free. But I'm here to tell you, tonight that it was not the right plan they saw it as themselves as the master plan but I'm, I've came here to tell you tonight what they needed was the master's plan they were locked up in the first place because they hadn't followed through with God's master plans for their life can I get an amen such is the condition of mankind today we are locked in a prison of sin, held in bondage to sin and shame, and we desperately want to escape. Uh, and we find all kinds of plans. We devise a master plan in our own minds uh, to escape uh, using all sorts of self-help books, uh, all kinds of positive thinking. Some use meditation. Some use false religions. 
while others just will use uh, uh, other methods and so on and so forth, all these different methods that people contrive to, to, to find a way to escape out of the sin problem that we have. I think mankind on the whole understands the problem. There's more uh, religious people on earth than there is atheists. Atheists are a very, very, very small fraction of the population of the world, yet they have a big mouth. But if you look at the population of the entire earth, most people believe in a god or gods. So mo most people acknowledge there is a problem, I need a god or gods. And, and unfortunately, a lot of them follow false gods. But they at least they acknowledge there's a problem. But the world has tried so hard to break free of sin's bondage for thousands and thousands of years. But they will never be successful to jailbreak until they follow God's master plan to escape. You see, like Alcatraz, which boasted to be escape free before these men found a way out, the prison of a sinful lifestyle will keep you locked up until you follow the master's plan. If you want true freedom, it flows through Jesus Christ. John 8, 36 says, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye are free indeed. Don't feel like you're a failure if you don't see everything line up like you've imagined, or if you make a mistake along the way. The important thing, and Pastor touched on it earlier this morning, is where you're headed. What direction are you going? Where is your tent pointed towards? See my first slide, my second slide really. Their first graph. You see this graph. You notice this is actually an upward trending graph. And we're able to see that, but you notice on this graph, that there are high points and there are low points. I wish I had a laser pointer. Maybe I'll get one. You notice right here, everything was going really great. But you notice right here, imagine this is your life's graph. And you've got ups and downs. But you notice the trend is going up. Some people dwell on the low points too long. I think there's some people in here that you highlight these areas more than you do those areas. Am I preaching to anyone? I think it's about time we get our mind off the low points and start getting our mind on God. Keep our eyes up in the air. We, can't, we don't have time. We're too far into it. We don't have time to dwell on the low points. We don't have time to stay on the ground. Uh, when we make a mistake, I think it's time you brush yourself off. You get back up and you keep your eyes on Jesus. Uh, because as long as you're pointing in the right direction, as long as your trajectory is going in the right direction, you're on your way to heaven. Hallelujah. Because if you... There we go. There's a laser pointer. See someone's pointing at something on there. Because, bring up my second graph, if you don't get up and brush yourself off, that's where you'll lead. We got to keep, we got to keep an upward trajectory. Not everything, everything you do is a sin issue, but everything you do points you in a direction. I'm going to repeat that. Not everything you do is sin, but everything you do will point you in a direction. What are you doing in your daily life? That's, what direction is your life pointing you to? Is it going up or is it going down? We need to keep our life pointing in the right direction. Don't let one point define who you are. Matthew 18, verses 12 through 13. It says, How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth to the mountains, and seeketh 
that which is gone astray. And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more than of that sheep, than of the ninety and nine which not, went not astray. I've come to tell you tonight, I've come to proclaim them on the mountaintops that God loves you so much that he's willing to leave the ninety-nine just to rescue one. God formulated a plan in the beginning that he would come down and die on the cross for you so you could have a second chance, so you could have a third chance. Uh, God is willing to leave the 99 to go find you and bring you back. Uh, I'm here to tell you tonight that, that if he would have died on the cross, even if it was only for one sinner, I think it's impossible for us to comprehend the kind of love that God has for us. But it's not impossible for us to experience it here tonight. Hallelujah. I think I don't, it's just I can't comprehend that God would do what he did just for me. I don't think that I am worthy of that. But God says, you are worthy. God says, I love you so much. Uh, I'm willing to come to earth uh, and to die for you so you could have another chance. God is not here to destroy you. He wants to prosper you. He wants to promote you. He's, some people get the wrong idea about God like he's standing up in heaven waiting for you to make a mistake so he can throw a lightning bolt down on you. No, he's actually to the contrary. He's looking for ways to help you. He's looking for ways to give you another chance. Uh, he's looking ways to give you more strength. Uh, he's looking to give more wisdom, more grace to see you make it through. For example, if you look at Peter... He denied Jesus three times. Can you imagine after seeing all that Peter saw, all that Peter experienced, all the miracles, being face to face with Jesus Christ in the flesh? Can you imagine the power? I mean, I just, you know, if I had a time machine, that's where I'd want to go. I'd go back to meet Jesus face to face. I don't think he would let me. I think he would prevent it. But... That, that's just something I, you know, think about. I would, I just want to meet him, and he'd be like, "All right, what are you doing here? You're not, you know, breaking the rules." But just to meet Jesus face to face, in the flesh, and Peter walked with him. He ate with Jesus. I mean, he was, he was Savior, but he was a friend. But Peter, for some reason, in the heat of the moment, denied Jesus Christ, not just once. But three times. Can you imagine how that made Peter feel? I mean, you just, I mean, thank God that he didn't stay. Thank God he didn't dwell on that low point on his graph of his life. But P Peter went on to preach Acts 2.38. Because God had a plan for Peter. And Peter never, he must have kept those words in the back of Jesus, on the back of his head that Jesus told him in Matthew 16, 19. He said, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever that shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever that shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Because God had a plan for Peter. And if Peter can make it through after a devastating mistake like that, I think we have the same opportunity today. God is looking to use someone here. And you're saying to yourself, I'm not worthy. I've, I've made a mistake. I've fallen. I've come short. And God's saying, I got mercy for you. I got grace for you. 
I'm tr- looking to set you up in the future for success. Uh, I'm looking for someone I can use. Uh, God's saying I'm looking for a Peter. I'm looking for someone to get up out, off the ground uh, and stop crying and weeping and all that mess uh, and to dust themselves off uh, and say, God, Lord, I'm pointing myself towards you. Uh, God, I'm walking towards you, God. Uh, I'm getting up. I'm pointing myself, my tent towards you. Just as God has long-term thinking, so should we. God thinks eternally, so he's just actually thinking. He can't really think long-term because he's not bound by time, so he's just thinking. We, however, we have the ability to think short-term and long-term. You know, like you're supposed to do when you're getting ready for retirement. You know, so many, you know, I hear about, you know, this guy told me the other day he just cashed in his whole 401k so he could buy a motorcycle. And I thought, oh, my goodness. And he took a big tax hit on top of that. So, I mean, I just can't imagine, you know, I mean, just the entire amount. Uh, that's just, you know, not wise. It may, you, know, I, you know, maybe you're going to take a little loan out. But we have to think long term as Christians. So important. Because we have to plan for eternity. We have to plan for the end, what's on the other side. We can't just plan what's on here on earth. Obviously, by default of being a Christian, you can't just plan for here on earth because you're already toward, going towards heaven. You're planning on living eternally. Investing in God's kingdom is the best retirement investment that you could possibly make while you're on earth. Hallelujah. It's the only absolute guarantee that has a return that pays out a trillion fold. And more than that, God's investments will never be rusted. God's investments will never take a downturn. Your investments in the kingdom will never be robbed. Uh, it will never tank. Uh, the, the thief can never steal it. Hallelujah. When you invest in God's kingdom, it's eternal. Take it to the bank. Uh, you can put, you can go all in. Hallelujah on God. But we have to think long term with God. Psalm 1611 says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are no, there are pleasures forevermore. God will never let you down. Hallelujah. In 2013, after multiple studies uh, by the Danish and American researchers, studies suggested that extreme exercising can damage your heart. And I know you're thinking, you're, you know, this is a marathoner talking to us. Let me go further. While exercise, uh, exercise uh, researchers, they haven't determined the exact toll it will, uh, that it takes on the heart muscles. This is you know, relatively uh, new research in, in the scientific realm. But evidence so far suggests that too much prolonged exertion over time can do irreversible damage to the heart. And also, in a similar study in 2012, a review of more than 50 studies published in the Journal of Mayo Clinic Proceedings, um, a researcher and his colleagues concluded that endurance athletes who participate in marathon-style running, biking, and swimming have uh, have five times the risk of developing an irregular heartbeat um, called arterial uh, uh, fibrillation, because of an enlargement of their heart muscles. Some also have more scarring on the heart tissue. And it also causes the muscles to harden on the heart. Now, you may be asking, you know, what are, in the world are you talking about? Let me link this for you. I think that sometimes as humans, we try so hard on ourselves to accomplish things on our own that in the end, we can actually damage our own hearts. If we rely too much on our own willpower and our own strength instead of God's plan, instead of God's strength, instead of God's power, 
then we have the risk uh, of hardening our hearts uh, and ruining our hearts. Uh, what God would have us to run on, but we, we became too exhausted and we became too damaged because we haven't relied on God, but instead we relied on ourselves. You see, we can't make it on our own. If you try too hard, if you rely on yourself too much, you're going to damage your heart. But God is calling his people today, saying, lean on me, trust in me. I have the master plan. If you just follow that. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Being confident of this very thing. I'm placing my trust in Jesus Christ because I am confident that he will perform a great work until he returns. You know, I was talking to our new members class this morning about what is happening in the world. And if you've never been to a new members class, I invite you every Sunday morning at 930. If you receive the Holy Ghost or be baptized and you want some good lessons on basic doctrines, I invite you. But we talked about God's plan and what he's doing in the end times. And we looked at some prophecy Joel 2.28, and God said, I will pour up my spirit upon all flesh. And we're seeing God's master plan being unfolded in the last times. Just in the year 1900, there was seventh, one seventh of a percent of Christians who had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now today, over 25% of Christians in the world are baptized with the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues. Over 25%. God has a master plan. God is pouring out His Spirit, just like He said. And they said, and the, and the researchers found that if this trend continues by the year 2025, 20, that over 1 billion people on earth will be filled with, with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Can I get a shout of praise? Right now, God is doing a great work. You're saying, I don't see the revival. I don't see the numbers. Well, just take a trip to South America and see what God's doing. Just take a trip to the Philippines and look at the people being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Go to Africa and look at the exponential growth of God's church. Hallelujah. Because God is in control. And God has a plan for you and I tonight. Hallelujah. Some of you may be thinking, I don't know what God's plan is for my life. I don't know what he wants with me. I don't feel like I have a purpose. I've come to tell you and invite you to this altar after I close. Because there's nothing worse than walking around aimlessly on this earth thinking you have no purpose. I remember there was this book that came out in, see what year, 2004, I want to say. A book it's a, from another denomination called Purpose Driven Life. And it was, it's a huge seller. And I, and, and I, you know, my friend lent it to me and I, I got through about 10 pages before I had to, you know, close it because I totally disagreed with what I was saying. But I can understand why this book was so popular. Because people in this earth, even in and out of church, are so desperately looking for a purpose. People are looking for a purpose in their life. And, and nobody wants to be without a job. No one wants to be without a purpose on this earth. And when they hear about a, a purpose-filled life uh, that gets people's attention, uh, and I'm here to tell you that God has not left you out. Uh, God hasn't forgot about you. Uh, you may feel like you've been kicked to the curb. Uh, you may feel like you've been downtrodden uh, or forgotten about. But I'm here to tell you that God has a specific purpose for you. 
And in this particular church of ours, we have many things that could be done. We have many things that need to be accomplished. Uh, we have many open uh, areas uh, where uh, we're waiting for people to step up. We're waiting for people to answer the call. Because I'm telling you, God is waiting to promote someone. The musicians could come. I'm wrapping up. You see, God has had a plan from the beginning for you and I. In John 1.1, 1, 1, he wasn't revealing himself as a trinity. But God said, in the beginning was the Word. And I want to tell you right now, the Word in the Greek it means logos. It means thought or plan. In the beginning, God had a thought or plan in his mind. And as he began to create the heavens and the earth, that plan started to come to fruition. And God is still unfolding His plan. His plan is not over yet. His plan, is, his plan will be complete when we're up in heaven. But while we're on earth, God still has a plan. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And God said, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And you wonder why Christians are so pro-life. You wonder why we want to protect the unborn. Because every last child in the mother's womb, God says, I knew you. I knew you. I knew you. You're not just a glob of cells. You're not just some uh, organism. But God says, I knew you. Hallelujah. That's why these elections are so important. But I digress. God knew you while you were in the womb. God had a plan for you before you even knew what the word plan meant. Before you even knew there's a Savior, God knew you. Hallelujah. And I want to talk to someone as we stand tonight. I want to talk to someone you are special. You are not forgotten. You're not just another face of the crowd. You're not just a nobody. God has a specific plan and purpose for you. You have value. God sees tremendous value. God would be willing to die on the cross just for you only. I want you to understand that. Huh. Hallelujah. Can we worship the Lord right now? Hallelujah. Lord, before I even knew you, before I even knew anything, God, before the disappointments, before the letdowns, before the mistakes, hallelujah, God, you knew me, and you had a plan and a purpose for me. Oh, God. Help me, Lord God, to see that plan. Lord, help me to accept your plan. Help me, Lord God, to accept your love tonight. Help me to accept your plan of salvation. Found in Acts 2.38. For your plan is for the whole world. It's for you and I, our children, and for everyone the Lord our God shall call. I want to invite anyone here tonight I want to invite you if you want to ask God to renew your purpose I want you to come here tonight to this altar if you don't know what your purpose is I want you to come and I want you to pray I want you to pray I want you to seek God I can't pray for you and show you God's purpose uh, in everyone's life but God can show you hallelujah hallelujah if you just need encouragement, make your way to the front. God will strengthen you. God will repurpose you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's pray tonight. Let's pray. God, show us your master's plan. Oh, God, help us, Lord, tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. If anyone wants prayer, I want you to come right here to the altar in the front. Right here from the pulpit, we'll have the elders pray for you. If anyone needs one special prayer, come here right in front of the pulpit.
Hallelujah. I want someone to be bold right now. Hallelujah. Get bold and step out in faith in Jesus' name. Yeah.
just close your eyes where you are and just just soak in this presence of the Lord. reveal reveal to us God he has a plan and a will for your life he has a plan for our families and our homes God, give us a glimpse. Lord, give us the grace and the courage to walk toward that plan. direct some lives in this atmosphere right here. Lord, let your anointing oil flow into this church
does my heart good when I see various parents that are praying with their children and need to be careful sometimes that we don't just come to the altar on other business but we need to train our children how to engage with God in the altar we need to help train their lives into a direction God does have a plan for every one of us we need the Lord to help baptize us with some courage to walk toward those things that he has shown us. And that starts with our walk with God. It's not his will for any to perish, but all of us to be saved. So that's, that's number one. I, I need to, I know that's his will. And so I need to walk toward his will and I've learned through life that as you take each step toward his will he'll guide you the Bible says the steps of a righteous man or woman are ordered of the Lord don't worry about what next year's step is worry about what tomorrow's step is and then just keep stepping keep walking Everybody said amen. Thank you, Brother Madej, for that good word tonight. Amen. There was a good word of God. This beautiful presence of God, you want to linger in the altar, linger in his presence, you're welcome to do so. There's fellowship on the other side. If you want to support the Silver Eagles, stop by and have a few minutes of fellowship over there. Greet one another, love one another in the name of the Lord. God bless you. It's been a great day in the house of God today. God be with you.